Senate Resolution Number 216 will be referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Remaining, on, remaining under motions and resolutions, Senator Gazelka. Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, pursuant to uh, Rule 26, I designate the following bills be made for special order for immediate consideration. Members, I believe the sheet is on your desk. Members, the first bill up for consideration is number 80 on general orders. It is House File 3100. And please make note that the language is actually Senate File 3019. And it's the fourth engrossment. And that is available on your computers online. So the, the fourth engrossment of Senate File 3019. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to move to amend House File number 3100 as follows. Deleting everything after the enacting clause and deleting the title of HF number 3100 and inserting the language after the enacting clause and the title of Senate File number 3019, the fourth engrossment. Members, this is the A50 amendment. Senator Jensen offers the A50 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Jensen moves to amend House File Number 3100 as follows: Delete everything after the enacting clause. This is the A50 amendment. Discussion on the A50 amendment. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to be very, very clear. We are now working on Senate File 3019, the fourth engrossment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Jensen. Colleagues, thank you for your attention to this matter, and thank you for the long road we've traveled. It's been more than a year that we've been talking about insulin. I would want to say thank you to my co-authors, Senator Eric Pratt, who carried this ball all the way down to the five-yard line, Senator Benson, who's worked at my side the entire time, Senator Wickland, and Senator Marty. When John Havlicek helped the Boston Celtics win one championship after another, the importance of a sixth man became apparent. And when Kevin McHale did the same thing, it became apparent that a sixth man is important. On this bill, the sixth man is Senator Jim Abler. Without Senator Abler's undying and tireless support for this project, it would have stumbled. So to Senator Abler, I thank you, and I thank you for the statesman that you are. I also want to say thank you to my colleague, Senator Matt Klein, who along the way has provided me insight from the in-hospital side of this equation. I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to Senator Little for calling me in the summer and asking me if I would work on a task force, and I did that. But perhaps the biggest thanks on this one should go to the people that have championed this cause from way back when. C.S. Lewis said 100% of people will die and you can't increase that number. He also said that you'll meet no ordinary people in your life. I never met Alex Smith. So I can't speak to the life he lived, but I can tell Alex Smith that in passing from this earth, he's had a far greater impact than he might ever have guessed because of his parents and especially his mom, Nicole Smith-Holt. So thank you to that family for the tragedy that they suffered and bore, and thank you to all the other advocates and champions of this bill. To the bill. Section 1 identifies a dependent child notice. If you're aging off of your parents' insurance company, you'll be notified. Subdivision 6 brings in an information requirement. We move to the actual insulin safety net program, the establishment. You remember that I've said over and over again, it's all about eligibility, sustainability, and a pharmaceutical network that will work. Well, this one gets to the eligibility right out of the blocks. The eligibility has been agreed to by the House and the Senate. So on the eligibility, we're, we're having to make eligibility determinations based on both the urgent and the ongoing program. You'll initially encounter the urgent program, and then you'll move on to the ongoing program. In the urgent program, the fulcrum of this program will be pharmacies. 
Pharmacies are already doing these things. So insulin will go to patients through pharmacies and on the ongoing program, it can even be a direct mail. I'll try not to belabor the issue because I know many people have spent a long time on this. One of the weaknesses of this bill is we haven't had the kind of discussion we need to have on co-pays, but I'm confident that in a conference committee, we can continue to work on what's the best place to land. We move to the ongoing safety net program. In this program, eligibility requirements do require that you be less than 400% of the federal poverty guideline. We move to the manufacturer responsibilities. I know that Eli Lilly and Sanofi and Novo Nordisk are all proud of the programs they've put together. And they put good programs together, programs that reach a lot of people's lives. But quite frankly, those programs aren't good enough. And what we're doing is we're saying, we're going to put together a program that utilizes a lot of the energies and talents that you've already put forth. But when it comes to insulin, there can be no allowance for people falling between the cracks. So we've come alongside the stakeholders, if you will, the major manufacturers, and we've said, these are the things we've needed to do. Countless meetings have taken place, and the manufacturer responsibilities are spelled out. We talk about the process of the ongoing safety net program. And in that process, I'll be glad to answer questions, but essentially, there will be an application made to the manufacturer. The manufacturer will identify eligible or not eligible. If a patient is deemed to be not eligible, there's an appeal process in place. Strict timelines are required. The pharmacy will be allowed to charge a copayment or a dispensing fee. We move to the Board of Pharmacy and the Minnesota Minsure program responsibilities, and we do have navigators in place. We have a dispute resolution in place. We have penalties in, replace, in place, and we have reporting requirements. We need to hold all players in this equation accountable, and this bill does that. I would like to thank Dr. Leah Greenside for helping come forward with some ideas and specifics regarding what kind of an external review might provide the level of accountability and comfort for all Minnesotans. We move to the actual pharmaceutical assistance programs, and we identify that there will be requirements for education campaigns across the state. We have a severability clause so that if one portion of the bill is called into question, the remainder of the bill stands. The appropriations are identified in section seven on page 11, and the total uh, appropriation bill is, or the fiscal note is somewhere around six or 700,000. In summary, this bill centers around the pharmacy. That's the fulcrum of the program. It's holistic in nature. It requires the pharmacies to bring the providers back into the equation. It establishes relationships with navigators so people can find their place so that nobody will be at risk of being in medical jeopardy. In regards to availability, its availability is to everyone on the urgent program. You could be a millionaire, but if you're in desperate need of insulin on a Sunday afternoon, you'll be able to walk out of that pharmacy with it. It's renewable, and the House bill doesn't have that. It potentially could serve as a model bill for us to get more work done in other challenges of vital life-sustaining medications that are potentially beyond the reach of every Minnesotan. It focuses on access to affordable insulin. It's portable. If you're a young person and you age off of your parents' insurance and you happen to be going on to school in another state and you're on a patient assistance program to get your insulin, you'll be able to use that same program in another state. Heaven forbid if it be Wisconsin. That was a joke, folks. All right. I may be going too quickly. It also has to do with getting a yes from all the stakeholders. We've worked hard to make sure that everybody can get behind this program. And lastly, it's relatively simple. We need to get a program up and running as quickly as possible. The mechanism for funding here is through the manufacturers, asking them to expand and extend the programs they have in place. So members, that's the bill before you. 
I stand ready to answer questions. Discussion on House File 3100 as amended. Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Senator Jensen. I, too, want to echo that this has been a long journey. Um, this, um, back in August of 2018, a constituent approached me with the issues going on in the insulin market, and, um, and it, it is good that we are here today and, and hopefully getting something in the conference committee to be negotiated. Um, I also want to uh, reiterate what uh, Senator Jensen said in terms of thanking um, Nicole and James for sharing the story of their son Alec with us. Um, there's absolutely no way uh, we are here today uh, this far uh, on a bill without their advocacy and, and um, you know, their their personal story that they've been willing to share with us. Um, so I'm hoping we can start today's uh, debate with something that we can um, all agree on, uh, which is that this, um, this bill should be named after Alex Smith. Um, so I'd like to offer the A1 amendment, Mr. President. Senator Little offers the A1 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Little moves to amend House File Number 3100 as amended by the Senate March 11, 2020, as follows, page 10 after line 28, insert. This is the A1 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, uh, the amendment is um, fairly simple. Um, it adds uh, this language, which is this act may be cited as the Alex Smith Insulin Affordability Act. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion on the amendment, Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Little. I stand in support of the amendment. Members, we have the A1 amendment in front of us. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, we're back on House File 3100 as amended. Further discussion? Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. This is a bill that's made a lot of progress. I think it's going the right direction, and I hope we can finish the last few things in conference committee. But the one biggest hole I see in the bill, and it's a good bill, as I said, overall, but the biggest hole I see in it is that the bill has a sunset in two and a half years. We're setting this bill up, we're creating a good program, we're trying to take care of people with emergency needs, and then two and a half years from now, the program just dies. Um, that's not a good way to do it. It's taken us a year plus to get this bill together, and I think once we address this problem, and I'm not calling this a fix because it's not, it'll address the emergency needs of people who need insulin. It doesn't address the ripping off of people that caused the problem in the first place, the extraordinarily high prices, but it does address the short-term need and the ongoing short-term need. And unless you think that the problem of insulin prices are gonna go away in the next two and a half years, I urge you to support the A5 amendment, which I'd like to offer at this time. Senator Marty offers the A5 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend House File Number 3100 as amended by the Senate March 11th, 2020, as follows, page 10, delete. This is the A5 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. And as I said, the amendment's very simple. It just deletes um, subdivision, I think it's 13, um, the one, the sunset. So it would be the same bill, no other changes in the bill, just simply remove the sunset because we we need to recognize that until the industry fixes the problem, we're going to have people who are having a crisis getting their insulin, and I urge everyone to support this. Discussion on the amendment. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Marty. I agree with Senator Marty that the way we framed up the sunsets may not be ideal, but I think the deliberate work of a conference committee would have the opportunity to obtain stakeholder input, allow us to consider staggered sunsets, 
Certainly there's the question of, do we sunset something or review something? I know I don't have the experience in this body that Senator Marty has, but I've been here long enough to know that if we're allowed through actions that we take to put off, procrastinate, and consign something to gridlock, that seems like our more natural direction. I think a sunset provides a bipartisan push that wherever we're at at the time of the sunset, we need to step back take a look and see if the program is doing what we want it to do, understand whether or not the program should be expanded, should we be looking at other vital life-sustaining medications at the time. At this point in time, Mr. President, Senator Marty, I could not support this amendment, but I very much support it being a priority topic in the conference committee. Further discussion on the A-5 amendment, Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. Unless some uh, massive structural overhaul of how uh, we are, as people and patients, are getting our, um, our prescription drugs, we're going to be in the same place we are in 2023, um, and people are still going to need to be able to afford their insulin. So I'd request that people do vote for the Marty Amendment, and I request a roll call vote. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, actually, Senator Little, for a lot of your leadership on this topic. Uh, we got involved early, and many other people, I'm not going to read, read list the people who have had a hand in this, but this, when this gets done, this is truly going to be a bicameral, uh, really, success story <laughs> after a long campaign that maybe has taken far too long. Um, just wanted to comment about this amendment. I have other thoughts on the bill, but I'll limit those, my thoughts to this now. Um, and, and so, Senator Little, in particular, you had commented um, that things will be the same in 2023. I think not on this topic. I think uh, it, when you look back uh, at an old guy at the end of a bar thinking about your career here, uh, thinking about what's happened, I think that you will see your fingerprints on moving something like this forward. Um, but I think you also, just even the last six months, eight months, noticed quite a shift on the part of the manufacturers in reacting to this, frankly, for fear of the specter of what was being proposed by you with, uh, with my encouragement. And, and so the, um, the House version has $38 million, I think, which is going to certainly result in lawsuits. Um, and they're saying it's a taking and it's kind of redundant to what they're doing. But I think all this effort as a nation-leading effort has really pushed the manufacturers into an amazing uh, amount of terror for what might happen, uh, worry about their public relations, and a lot of bona fide good activity. Uh, the social media reports about how it's going are actually improving lately. Uh, and compared to the ones eight months ago, like, it doesn't work, it's clunky, I can't get in, my child's at risk. And, um, and so, I think that it's prudent as a, in, in good governance that we um, have some kind of a change. I will predict to you, though, Senator Little and others who would think this amendment is a good one for the moment, uh, is that I, for me, uh, a sunset on the emergency program is, uh, is going to be not a non-starter if this comes back with that still on, and I'll be voting with you to send it back to conference. Uh, talk with Senator Jensen. He also is concerned that the essential programs go forward in a good way. And I know this will be discussed in, um, in, in the conference time. And if this was the final passage, I would agree with you that this should be put on. This is going into a, a conference with people who are as interested as you and I are in this topic. So, so uh, members, I would encourage a, a no vote on the amendment and I uh, let the process keep working. And I think at the end, we're gonna be really happy with the array of sunsets in the bill. Further discussion on the A-5 amendment, Senator Marty. Mr. President, members, uh, Senator Abor, I, I can't picture the advocates who have been pushing for the last year for this to say that it's okay to shut it down in two and a half years. I don't think one of them would say this fight has been easy or quick and that two and a half years from now, well, we can just quickly extend it. I think they understand how tough the problem is. This problem was caused 100% by some pharmaceutical manufacturers 
who raised the price over and over and over again, 10, 15, 20-fold over the prices they introduced the drugs at. And they were making money. They priced the drugs initially at a price they'd make money on. And then they jack them up higher and higher and higher because they can get away with it. They caused the problem 100%. And I know they don't like the, they want the bill to have a sunset in it. But I can't picture, I think you could talk to the insulin for all folks in Minnesota, any state, there are small groups like that elsewhere. I don't think there's a single person there who thinks it's a wise idea to sunset the bill. As I said, I think there's a lot of good things in the bill. I think the trouble is you can't say we put all this work in for a year and a quarter or more than that, and then when it finally gets to the finish line, we say we're going to sunset it in two and a half years. If, if I believed we were going to have reasonable drug prices in two and a half years, I'd say, fine, we can do that. But we're not going to, and I think it's the two sides in this, the, the advocates who are saying we need insulin to live, we can't afford it, and Alex Smith, and another person last summer who died from this. I don't think any one of them would say this is a fair balance. They'd say, you got to repeal the sunset, let it go on, and then if we fix the prices, we can quickly repeal it at that time. I urge you to support the amendment. Further discussion on the A5 amendment, Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, uh, I agree with Senator Jensen. I think this is uh, an amendment that we should not adopt on this bill. Uh, having worked on this uh, for a long time, first of all, this is not a two and a half year sunset. Uh, where we're at now would be uh, closer to three and a half. And when we started, it would have been closer to four. Uh, there are a lot of changes that have happened in the affordability, and let's, let's talk about some of those. Let's talk about what we did last year that reduced the, the co-pays on insulin, have made insulin more affordable for more Minnesotans today than it was in the past. Uh, I've spent a lot of time looking at this, and, and we may differ, but uh, I don't believe that uh, it's entirely price gouging by the uh, industry. I believe there are some structural pieces having to do with uh, the distribution system and the use of extremely high rebates uh, that have been uh, used as profit centers along the distribution channel that have been baked in, into the high price. Uh, I do believe that we're going to see significant change in this area over the next three and a half years. And I think it's wise for us to put a sunset on there so that we have to go back and take a look at this program reevaluate whether or not we have the right structure, whether, the not, whether or not the landscape has changed again. We have seen dramatic changes in insulin affordability just since April 1st of 2019. We've seen dramatic changes in insulin affordability beginning at, at, of th at this calendar year, and I think we're going to continue to see dramatic changes in insulin affordability, and I think it's wise for this legislature to be forced, force ourselves, let's put our own, our own uh, uh, control on this to say we want to take a look at this and let's, say, let's make sure we're meeting the needs of Minnesotans in the way that they need to be made and not just putting this thing on autopilot. So Mr. President, I uh, urge a no vote on the amendment. Further discussion on the A5 amendment, Senator Relf. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have to thank Senator Pratt for stealing my thunder here. Um, I think we have to look at this, and we can't just do this, fix it, and forget it. This is an ongoing problem, and we have to keep that issue elevated so that we don't just let it slip under the rug and forget about it. I think having a sunset will force us to keep this in the forefront to meet needs that we cannot predict now. We are in a rapidly changing environment, and we will need to keep a close watch on this. So I believe that having a sunset in there to force us to continue to review what we have done and what we will need to do is a good thing. Thank you. I urge a vote against this amendment. Further discussion on the A5 amendment, Senator Little. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Senate body, uh, these arguments make no sense to me. If in 2023 uh, we've solved everything, we've functionally changed the way our health care system operates, then no one will have to use this program anymore. And we can all celebrate. 
But if we haven't solved every problem, we haven't solved it in this market, then we're going to need the program still for diabetics that need insulin to live. What I'm hearing is we're asking those that require insulin every single day to live to bet on the future and to bet on politics. And from my perspective, that's not a safe bet. Further discussion on the A5 amendment? Seeing none, the Secretary will take the roll on the amendment. Up. Oh. Senator Jensen, we're taking the roll. I'm sorry. Senator Thank Jensen, we have a roll call. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 31 ayes and 35 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. <laughs> members, we're back on House File 3100 as amended. Senator Marty. Mr. President, I have the A4 amendment at the desk. Senator Marty offers the A4 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend House File Number 3100 as amended by the Senate March 11, 2020, as follows, page 4, line 10, delete. This is the A4 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President, members. This simply takes the, in the, the emergency insulin program, the one that people can get for only one month. I think the House bill has three months. I actually think it should be longer than one month because to get in the next program they have to apply for, it could take more than a month. But, um, but to get into that right now, it's a $75 copay, which is more than a lot of people who are struggling to pay for insulin can afford. And I urge us to accept this amendment of its reducing it to $25. As a matter of fact, in the mid-range program, the year-long program in this bill, it's $25 a month copay. I think it should be the same thing for the one-month emergency one. Matter of fact, that's where it's more important to have. So I urge your support for the A4 amendment. Discussion on the A4 amendment. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Marty. In regards to the A4 amendment, I would oppose this amendment. I do agree with Senator Marty that the present structure of co-pays is not where we want to end up. But actually, there are several co-pay identifications in this bill, and I think that uh, the good work of the upcoming conference committee, hopefully, uh, will be able to take care of some of those things. I'm not certain that the $25 number is the correct number. I'm not certain that $75 uh, shouldn't be modified in a way that we haven't entertained as of yet. And I look forward to hearing um, from the other body in terms of what they would like us to do as well. So I speak against this amendment. Further discussion on the A4 amendment, Senator Benson. Mr. President and Senator Marty, what we don't know is how much it's going to cost the pharmacist to take on this very advanced role. This isn't something that they do normally, helping people to enroll in programs. And so I would like to make sure that the number remains high enough that farmer or farmer, pharmacists are duly reimbursed for the extra effort that they're going to have to put in. We can debate what that number might be, but we know just for the Medicaid population with a very straightforward um, prescription filling process and very straightforward payer relationship, 
that that cost is 12 to $14. And so I don't know if your $25 would even cover the cost that the pharmacist would incur by assisting someone enrolling in the program. Um, in the bill, we're willing to pay navigators and other assisters for helping them to enroll in the program. And so this is not to enrich the pharmacists, and this money doesn't go to a pharmaceutical company or an insurance company. It's to make sure that the cost to the pharmacy for standing up this program um, are in fact covered. Further discussion on the A4 amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I'm one who has a big problem with the whole concept of co-payments, making it harder for people to access health care. The folks we're trying to deal with here, the rest of the bill has $25 co-payments for $25 a month co-payments for the, matter of fact, I think it's $25 co-pay for three months. But here, the urgent time, when it's most important, the time when the Alex Smiths of the world show up at the pharmacy without enough money to pay for something, saying they need it to live, and we're saying $75. I think this is an important one. I think it's a small thing. This is not the issue that's going to break the pharmacists. Um, I think we've got a whole range of issues we have to address here. And again, I see this only as an emergency bill. But to me, it's not unreasonable to say, let's have, if we're going to have a copay there, let's have one that most people are used to, something like $25, because these are the emergency cases we're dealing with here. So I urge your support, and I think I will ask for a roll call on this, because I, I think it would be helpful for us to go into conference committee with a bit stronger bill than this, because it's important, it's important for the Alex Smiths of the world, and I urge you to support this. A roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Further discussion on the A4 amendment, Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Marty. Thank you, Senator Benson, for your comments. I think they're spot on. This program is put before you today if, it, if you will, it centers around the pharmacies and the relationships. I would take issue with Senator Marty's comment that this is not going to break pharmacists. If you look at what industry in the healthcare marketplace has taken more hits and had more shrinkage and more absorption, uh, there is no other than the independent pharmacy over the last 12 months. I think the fact of the matter is if we were to take on this amendment without giving the pharmacies a chance to help us understand exactly what it is we're asking of them, I think we would be taking what I would consider an anti-pharmacy position. They need to have a dispensing fee for the work they do. They do. They need to be reimbursed for the stocking and the storing and the things that they do. And they also need to be, in some form or another, provided with reimbursement for the navigation and the application services that they will be providing, and already do, many times out of the goodness of their heart. So I think it's an excellent amendment in terms of bringing to the attention of the Senate that we have to make a move on this. We'll have to talk about this in conference committee. But I do not think that this is a time we need more stakeholder involvement on this specific question, and specifically from pharmacies. I speak against the amendment. Further discussion on the A4 amendment, Senator Tomasoni. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator Jensen yield for a question? Senator Jensen will yield. Senator Tomasoni. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Jensen, I'm, as I'm reading the language, and I think I'm reading the right language, it says the pharmacy may collect a co-payment of $75. Is there some kind of a, a, um, a test for the pharmacy to determine whether or not the co-payment should be as much as $75 or less than $75? How do we know if... Um, a pharmacist may charge less than $75 because it doesn't say the, the pharmacy shall collect. It says the pharmacy may collect in an amount not to exceed $75. Is, is there some kind of an income test here? Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Sen Senator Tomasoni, for the opportunity to address that question. You make an excellent point. Quite honestly, there are many independent pharmacies around the state that are doing much of the service identified in this bill, and they're charging nothing because they know that that person doesn't have the $75 to come up with. So the language may was in there so that we're not, if you will, issuing an ultimatum to them. Exactly the reason why we need to have the pharmacists back in front of the conference committee helping us understand what would work best, what would be most fair. But to take this from 75 to 25 without that input, I think I agree with you, Dr. Tom, Senator Thomasoni. You've just uh, gotten a degree. Uh, I think that there is no specific 
language that would say, is it 75, 50, or 25? But the reason it says May right now is because oftentimes they're not charging it. Further discussion on the A4 amendment? Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to respond to some of the comments that suggested that I was not concerned about the pharmacists and their costs because I am very concerned. I have another bill I would welcome a hearing on that, that would try and at least give, remove the remaining part of the pharmacist's gag rule where they can't tell their patients, they can't even tell the health plans that they're losing money on the drugs the way the drug pricing system is set up. I talked to one independent pharmacy in my area who was losing that morning. He had just filled a prescription for a woman that was costing him $175 just in the drug purchase. To purchase the drug, to give to the woman, cost him $175 less than his total reimbursement. No cost for any of his other expenses, no cost for dispensing, no cost for anything else. And he can't even tell the patient he's losing money on it. He can't even tell the health plan he's losing money on it. Those are the kind of things we could do to help the pharmacists. This whole system is so screwed up. And I'm not trying to pick on the pharmacists here. I'm just trying to say we're trying to deal, in this case, with people whose lives are at risk. Alex Smith is a good name to use because he did lose his life for this. And saying we're just going to let you get it for $25 for one month's supply is not a big deal to the pharmacists. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm saying let's fix it where they're losing money on other prescriptions. It's, it's outrageous what we're doing to the independent pharmacies. I agree. But this isn't the way we make it up to them. Take it to the Alex Smiths and say, well, you don't have 75 bucks, you're out of luck. I just think that this is a small thing. I'm not saying it's small in terms of it's important to the, it's important to the people who are at risk. And yes, we should help the farmers get a fair shake, but this isn't where they're losing their fair shake. They're losing the fair shake on the rest of the pricing. Further discussion on the A4 amendment. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Marty. I would remind this body that at our last session, we passed a pharmacy benefit manager bill, which did remove those gag clauses in terms of governing the conversations between pharmacists and patients. So I think that there may have been an inaccuracy embedded within those last comments. Further discussion on the A4 amendment. Senator Marty. Mr. President, I'll share the bill with you now because it is a gap. In, I will get it to you later. A bill I introduced to address it because there is a gap. They cannot tell the patients when they are losing money on a drug and they cannot tell the health plans. They're not even allowed to talk to them. The gag rule removal, you did remove part of it. I strongly supported that. There are other parts of the gag rule that still persist, so that was not an inaccurate comment. Members were on the A4 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 30 ayes and 36 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. <laughs> members, we're back on House File 3100 as amended. Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. There has uh, been a number of times in which the term stakeholder has been mentioned. Um, as I've uh, worked on this bill uh, with many of my colleagues, um, I want to say that when I consider a stakeholder, I do not consider uh, insulin manufacturers to be a stakeholder. Uh, if, if we charge people $5,700 a year for oxygen to breathe, or if we charge people $5,700 a year for water to drink, uh, there would be rioting. Yet for those with diabetes, uh, 
we charge them $5,700 a year for the insulin that they need to live. Uh, so when I'm viewing a stakeholder, there's only one stakeholder in mind during this debate, and that's the people that need insulin to live. Um, I'd like to offer the A2 amendment. Senator Little offers the A2, the A2 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Little moves to amend House File Number 3100 as amended by the Senate March 11, 2020, as follows: Page 8, Line 13, Delete. This is the A2 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. If uh, an insulin manufacturer decides not to follow this bill, if they decide they aren't going to reimburse pharmacists, or if they decide they aren't going to set up this program uh, for patient assistance, their fine is $100,000 per year of noncompliance. For context, in 2016, uh, the top three insulin manufacturers of their top five most common insulins uh, sold $14 billion. $14 billion in sales just for their top five insulins. So what is $100,000 per year going to do? There's only three companies that make this insulin. So at most, uh, they're each going to pay $100,000. So that's $300,000. I hope you'll follow my math. So $300,000 divided by $14 billion is 0.0002143. Again, 0.0002143. That's pretty close to zero. I wanted to provide some context in maybe our daily lives as to what that actually means. If you get a speeding ticket for uh, 15 miles per hour over the limit, that speeding ticket will cost you $145. So you go to court to pay your fine. Your fine in this context would be less than one third of one penny. Not much of a deterrent to speeding. And this is not going to be much of a deterrent uh, to following the law. Here's what I bet will happen. If we put this in place, you're going to see these three insulin manufacturers walk in here. They're each going to write a check for a million dollars and say, call me in 2030, because they're not going to follow this. The A2 amendment um, would help with this. The A2 amendment would increase the penalties. It would be $100,000 per month. And then if you're still not in compliance after the sixth month, it would bump it up to $200,000 per month. In my opinion, it's still not enough, but I think this is a reasonable fee to get people to follow this bill. If we like this bill, if you're supporting this bill, then we should want people to follow this bill. I urge you to support the A2 amendment, and I would request a roll call vote. A roll call has been requested. Roll call is granted uh, to the A2 amendment. Senator Jensen. Thank you. Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Little. As always, I enjoy your input. We evidently have a different dictionary that we use. Webster, stakeholder, one who is involved in or affected by a course of action. I think it's short-sighted to limit the roster of stakeholders involved with this bill. But enough with Webster. To the central point of what Senator Little is proposing, I agree with him that $100,000 per month or per year of noncompliance is not nearly enough. I've talked with the stakeholders in regards to the pharmaceutical manufacturers, and they understand. They also like, to Senator Little's amendment, they like the notion of if there's a noncompliance penalty, that it would be over a month period so that if it's pointed out to a manufacturer, they can fix it and rectify it. So I think that the manufacturers of insulin would agree with Senator Little's amendment that per month would be more appropriate than annually. Because if you slipped out of it for one day out of 365 days, you could conceivably be penalized for that. In regards to the specific numbers, Senator Little, I have no problem with it. I don't know that the House, this is not matching up with the House language, the way you've presented your amendment, but I have no problem with it. I do think it's important that whatever penalties we put in place for noncompliance have teeth to them. I have in front of me an article I received last week where a pharmaceutical company came out with, and they basically helped fund a study, and what it did is it, it put a generic diabetic medication that's available for $3 a month against 
its own trade name, pharmaceutical, which costs $400 a month. And at the end of the study, they celebrated it because they found that their $400 a month trade name drug was not inferior to the generic drug for $3 a month. This is the kind of obfuscation and sophistry that we see in medical literature today. Pharmaceutical manufacturers have tremendous advantages as they promote their products and in ways doing so are often duplicitous. So I share Senator Little's concern. I want to send a strong message to manufacturers. We expect you at some point in time to stop this. So to Senator Little's amendment, I support it. Further discussion on the A2 amendment? Senator Little. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Jensen, I appreciate uh, the support um, of the, uh, the A2 amendment. Um, and uh, as a result, I would withdraw my motion for a roll call. Senator Little withdraws the request for a roll call. Any further discussion on the A2 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. Motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Members were back on House File 3100 as amended. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will give House File 3100 its third reading. House file number 3100, a bill for an act relating to health care establishing an emergency insulin program. Third reading. Final discussion on House file 3100, Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President and members. And I, I, I had a few comments in my one other comment about the other amendment, commending people for working on this. It is really important that no Minnesotan ever die for lack of insulin. Uh, and I met one of the young men, uh, Jesse, uh, when he uh, visited my district. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't walk in. He was wheeled in, and I got to look at him as he lay in his casket. Uh, he was an attractive young man. He wore a bow tie, had a vest, and he was quite still. And. I got to see his family, and I saw his young cousin, and the, the grief was overwhelming. And it turned out that the, uh, the funeral was just a few miles from my house in my district, and so I thought I'd better go. And I, I didn't make any, any errors about anything. I just went and grieved as, got to meet him and, and grieve as, as one human being. And uh, I don't know if people understand this, uh, but the... Uh, it seems as though the, if there's a typical family where they struggle with type 1 diabetes and even type 2, that they wake up, the parents wake up every morning hoping that their child will be breathing, that they made it through the night with managing their insulin. And, or the individual themselves know that they are just a short gap away from not getting to see the next sunrise. And th this is not practice for them. This is not some way to... You know, they don't, they don't, they just wound up in this circumstance. And, and the, uh, the comments that they make are not on behalf of any national political group. They're just parents and, and people wanting a chance to get to be old and to get to enjoy the things that we take for granted, not worrying about how my blood sugar is. I just eat and whatever happens, happens. And the worst, I get cranky. And you've seen some of that sometimes. Um, but this is a tremendous work. It is far too delayed. We should have got this done last year. This could have got done last year, but here we are today. And for all the people that had a hand in making this move forward, I'm not gonna list your names, but thank you. Thank you for that. And so, what the people that are watching here are hoping, could you work together and get something done on this? And Senator Jensen, I'm going to commend you in particular for being the current person at the helm and, and Representative Howard over in the House. And I know that they are committed to getting this done. And part of the reason why this debate is so short today and why the amendments were so few is because of how far this bill has come in recognizing it has to work. This bill needs a little buffing and shining but it works, 
It's not going to cause a lawsuit. It's not going to get shut down in the courts. We're not going to pass something and have nothing happen like the bills last year. Every bill brought up last year would have been either inoperative or shut down in the courts. And we would have felt good, oh, we passed something, but they wouldn't have worked. This bill works. And so, and I just want to comment one thing about why the other version with the $38 million might be a problem. Uh, Minnesota, as you may know, is 2% of the country. We're 1 50th of the states, but 2% of the people. And so whatever money goes uh, out the door as a, a fee or a pay payment by the, in the, in the, by the manufacturers, insulin manufacturers, for instance, if you multiply that times 50, then add California and then have more there. But we're, we're talking two to three times. That's a $2 billion annual impact on a manufacturer. And frankly, for me, I don't care. I think they deserve to pay $2 billion because they unnecessarily raise the price. And I'm so angry with them for their lack of morality and humanity for doing that. But practically speaking, they have a lot of lawyers. And they have a lot of friends. And they know how to do any number of injunctions. And if we did that version with $2 billion impact, they'd see that as the, the first of many hits, equaling more than $2 billion. This would be tied up forever. And another person like Jesse would die. And Mr. President and members, I'm not willing to do that, to watch that happen. And so I want to thank everybody who had a hand in this on both sides of the aisle, that we're close to getting this thing done and making sure that no one in Minnesota die for lack of insulin. And on behalf of that, I thank this body for having such a great discussion today and a bill like this moving forward. And I wish the conference committee Godspeed as they work to resolve these minor differences. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, we're on final discussion for House File 3100. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I stand in support of this bill, uh, just as I have every insulin bill that has come before this body, because insulin is a life-saving drug. And it is essential that Minnesotans are able to access this. I appreciate all the work on the bill that is before us now. It will allow Minnesotans who cannot afford this life-saving drug to have access to both emergency and low-cost insulin, and they'll be able to get it at their pharmacy, where that uh, relationship is and is so important. I also support the increased penalties should the pharmaceuticals not stand true to their word and provide low-cost and emergency insulin. I think this bill has come a long way, and there have been a lot of people who have worked on it. The one thing I would say, though, it is had taken too long. So uh, we send this bill off today and look for a swift resolution in conference committee and getting this to the governor's desk for a signature so every Minnesotan will know that they have access to emergency and low-cost insulin. It's a matter of life. Final discussion on House File 3100, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, first, I want to say I strongly urge everyone to vote in favor of this bill. It will make a difference. It will save lives. Second, I hope that in conference committee that we will let the House prevail, especially on the important points such as the sunset. There's no excuse for sunsetting a program that's going to be needed. Third, I want to say that this has been a long effort. I remember, I think it was a year and a quarter, maybe a year and a half ago, that Senator Little brought together some insulin advocates. They wouldn't have called themselves insulin advocates. They were people with diabetes who were coming in and telling their stories about how bad it was. He brought together people of both parties and started some things moving on that. And Senator Wickland, who's not here today, um, for other reasons, I. I think she helped carry this with um, Representative Howard in the House, and I think I wish we had done it last year. I'm glad we're moving it now. And Senator Jensen's done an amazing job of trying to bring together some of the differences, um, especially when the pharmaceutical industry was not willing to pay anything for it, and now they are paying for a big chunk of it. I think that's very important progress, but I want to say one comment about where this bill fits in, in overall scheme of things. That is, this is one drug, 
One outrageous price that we're going to be helping people with emergency needs, people under 400 percent of the poverty line. One part of the health care system. And we got a crisis here. I can name hundreds of other drugs that people have the same difficulties with. And this one is different because if you don't get it right away and there are thousands of people who need it right away, that they die. But there are plenty of other ones that are killing people because they don't access it. And now as we deal with the coronavirus, we see what a system we have when a lot of people who we want to go see the doctor at the right time don't have the money to go to the doctor and they're not covered or they have high deductibles. We've got to address those problems. And so this is a very important but tiny piece of the big picture. I strongly urge your support for the bill and strongly urge the Senate conferees to, uh, to cave to the House on the sunset because that's really an outrageous provision in this bill. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to thank everybody who has participated in this long process to get us to this point, and I know we are not done. Uh, there is still definitely more work to be done moving forward. Um, I do want to specifically recognize Senator Wickland, who could not be with us here today due to a family matter that came up unexpectedly, um, but uh, she has given so much to this issue and to the, the people who will be helped immeasurably by uh, its passage when we get it done, and, and she will continue to be a part of it. So uh, I look forward to supporting this bill and, and seeing it come forward and making a difference for Minnesotans. Thank you. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> um, I just wanted you know, to uh, repeat a little bit of what Senator Marty uh, just said. This is a worthy bill worth uh, supporting. It can be better, as was illustrated by some of the amendments that were offered and, and not accepted. So I look forward to the conference committee process and voting for an even better bill on the way back. Um, but it solves, uh, you know, kind of halfway solves one problem with one pharmaceutical. And uh, we know that the pharmaceutical industry um, behaves in a manner that is well outside of the bounds of anything that is um, even remotely acceptable in terms of the public's interest. Just last year, 3,400 drugs boosted their price in the first six months uh, at more than five times the rate of inflation and some uh, boosted their prices on the order of 300 percent and more. And these are crucial drugs that people rely on to treat cancer, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, allergies, and the like. One instance uh, that I'm familiar with is a drug that would allow people to avoid uh, transmission of HIV. Um, this wasn't necessarily a spike last year. This has just been true since this drug was released onto the market. Uh, the uh, company that owns that particular pharmaceutical didn't even do the research to prove its efficacy. That was done at taxpayer expense over the resistance of that particular drug company. And um, lo and behold, it was discovered to be highly effective for this purpose. Guess how much this uh, pharmaceutical costs to manufacture per year? I'll tell you, $60. Guess how much they charge per year for a prescription? $20,000. It is covered by a lot of health care plans and public plans, but that means that's putting pressure all over the system for us. It's allowing these pharmacy benefit managers to scoop up uh, you know, the little kickback that they get for the differential that they might negotiate in that drug price, keeping those prices artificially high. Um, that is a shock to the conscience. $60 for the efficacy that they didn't even do the research for, that they resisted. $20,000 they charge an individual or their plan for that drug. This is what we're talking about, members. We have a larger problem on our hands, and we need to get to work on that. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Final discussion on the bill. Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. I also want to say thank you to Senator Gazelka and Senator Bach and Senator Kent as well as Senator Benson for providing the leadership to move this forward because there have been a lot of hoops to jump through. And I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you uh, to all the folks up at the dais that helped make these things work, so thank you. Renewability, portability, a potential model for other medications that are life-sustaining, a holistic approach reestablishing relationships that need to be in place for the best diabetic care to be provided, and strong measures of accountability. These are the things that I'm especially proud of in this bill. A month ago, I had a patient come in, 
she asked me if she needed to have her EpiPen refilled. I said, well, let's take a look at it. She said, well, I think it might have expired. And I said, well, a lot of times medications can still be useful and effective after the expiration date. Let's take a look at it. It was 2007. EpiPens have gone up dramatically. So to many of those comments that have been made on the floor here today, we need a model that works. We need to demonstrate to Minnesotans that we're ready and prepared and able to do what needs to be done. What I've learned around here is that oftentimes courage means not conforming. And I think that's what we're sort of doing here as a body. We're not conforming to what we've been told we have to do. We've not let manufacturers tell us what they're going to do. We've not stuck to the same old formulas. We said we're going to try something that we think can work, that will provide eligibility measurements, that will provide that every unit of insulin will be paid for by the pharmaceutical manufacturers, that no person will be allowed to slip through the cracks, that we have a sustainable model, and that we have a pharmacy network that can get the job done. That's what we're doing today. I appreciate very much the support of the governor's office and the support of Representative Mike Howard as, as we move forward in the next steps. Today, this, is, this action is for all diabetics. It's for anyone with pre-existing conditions because arguably the most prevalent pre-existing condition we have is diabetes mellitus. This is for all of us. This is for our future. And I hope no one would see fit to oppose this bill as we take a vote. Thank you for your audience, members. Final discussion on the bill, Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members and uh, Senator Jensen for helping us to get over the finish line and the people before you uh, that have been working on this bill. Uh, just to, as I think about this bill, uh, we all identified the problem. It's how do you find the solution that we can get to and why do we have a solution today that we're going to have virtually everybody vote for. And I think it's a lesson that we can learn for other things that we're going to be doing here. And it's, it's not that you approach, in this case, the pharmaceuticals and whack them with a stick and then end up in a lawsuit like Senator Abler talked about or, or a lot of resistance. But instead, uh, Senator Jensen, I know Senator Pratt before him, coaxing them with a carrot uh, produces the real results that we want. So instead of the, the language that's coming out of the other body that would cost $38 million and a whole nother layer of bureaucracy, we have the pharmaceuticals providing the resources to the pharmacies and a model that frankly can work for other things as Senator Jensen talked about. And so particularly proud that the Senate has worked together to figure out a solution that actually works uh, and likely can be something that we use in the future. So Senator Jensen and, and everybody that worked on this, thank you. Members were on final passage of House File 3100 as amended. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 66 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to. Members, the next bill up on general orders is number 30, House File 2959, Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, members, uh, I bring this bill before us to uh, pass $50 million for new or additional rural finance authority loans available to our farmers. Uh, this bill is very important to our state and to our farmers that use this and benefit from the RFA program. Our farmers are very important to our state's economy. 
Of course, our rural way of life is uh, very important to those of us that live in rural Minnesota, and farmers are so vitally important in feeding our state and feeding the world. Whether it's grain crops, whether it's livestock, whether it's new farmers beginning, whether it's existing farmers that have found challenging times in this economy and need to restructure, that is what the RFA loan program is for. So members, this $50 million will help those farmers that find themselves in need of lower interest rates, reduced payments, and an operating loan or an, a loan to start out their farming operation. It's been a very successful program since its inception in 1986. Mr. President, uh, that's when the, pro the program, the RFA program was uh, originated after the farm crisis of the 1980s. And so members, uh, this program has served nearly 4,000 farmers over its time. Nearly $300 million have went out in loans, operating loans, or livestock improvement, or building loans, or purchase, uh, land purchase for farmers uh, beginning. And nearly every one of those dollars has been repaid by the borrower. Less than $600,000 has been lost by default. 555,000 to be exact out of the 289 million we have authorized through the legislature. So this $50 million is a very safe, a very valued program for those farmers finding themselves in this need. So it has worked well. The program is out of money or nearly out of money Yet farmers right now are getting, are getting their plans for spring planting finalized with their banks, the operating loans that they need to put the seed in the ground to bring that next load of cattle or pigs into their farming operation. Uh, they need this money out the door as soon as we can possibly get it to them. And that's why we bring this bill forward today. We want to uh, act quickly and make sure this money is available and there's no slow down in the process for those needing the RFA loans. Members, uh, let me share a couple of stories with you. Uh, first of all, farm income in the last several years has been declining. The latest numbers we have from 2018 from the University of Minnesota is the average farm income was down again in 2018 by 8%, $26,000 uh, as the average farm income. However, the lowest 20% farm income had lost $72,000. Folks, crops continue to uh, have low prices. Strong supply in our country and around the world keep prices depressed. And in many cases, farmers are losing money on those crops or barely breaking even. It's those tough economic times along with low livestock prices in many cases. Dairy has been down for several years. Thankfully, it's been up the last six months. Uh, dairy farmers are uh, feeling uh, more optimistic right now than they were a year ago. But members, those challenging times are real. And we want our farmers to know that they are important to us. They are the lifeblood of rural Minnesota. They are the lifeblood and the food that we need to survive on. And but for them, we'd all have a lot harder way to sustain our lives and our families and our standard of living. And so this is one significant, albeit small, way the state can really step in and have an effective program to partner with those farmers. Now what happens is the local community bank is still the front front-end lender. This program gives the, state, uh, the bank a guarantee, a 45% guarantee of the loan. The bank takes 55% of the risk, much like this SBA program for small businesses. And that's what farmers are. They're small businesses. That 45% risk gives the farmers also a lower interest rate, much lower than typically they're getting at a conventional loan that they don't qualify before because they're either beginning or trying to reorganize. 
So members, that partnership is valuable with our banking community across our state, the community bankers, and all the bankers that are on the front end of working with farmers and making this capital available. So this 45% guarantee is so significant that it really does make the difference between a farmer starting or a farmer continuing on or not. And as I told you, the default rate is less than 1%. In fact, it's less than 0.2% of loans that have been defaulted on. 0.19% is the default rate over the years since 1986. That is impressive, members. And so if that is a strong reason why we should support this. Let me just finish with one example of a young farmer that has benefited from this recently, uh, shared with me by uh, one of our uh, banks uh, that, that have worked with the farmer in southern Minnesota, I think it's Senator Goggin's district. Well, a young farmer uh, just got out of college, grew up on a farm with his family, wanted to get his own farm and expand and uh, continue to in the farming tradition. 22 years old, worked with uh, his banker, lender, worked with the Rural Development uh, Beginning Farmer Program to keep the down payment low. 100 acres with a farm place, uh, buildings, some sheds, a house came up for sale near his parents' farm. While he had a full-time job uh, off the farm, he continued uh, with that, but was able to buy this land close to home, to, close to his family's farm have a place to live, to fix up, to have cattle. Needed $700,000 to buy this 100-acre farm place and land. Was able to bring cattle in, was able to fix up his house, continue working off-site so he can continue his dream of someday being a full-time farmer. But in the meantime, he's got enough cattle, farms 100 acres part-time in the evenings and weekends, keeps his full-time job, but it's because the RFA program allowed his situation to be able to cash flow with a low down payment, lower interest rates, a savings of over $5,700 a year in his scenario, just on interest alone, which made the difference for him to be able to start as a part-time farmer, start doing what he loved with his goal, hope, and dream of becoming a full-time farmer, just like his parents, just like he grew up. Members, there's stories like that all over your districts, all over our state, and there's no better time for us to stand alongside our farmers and tell them, we're with you, you're important to us, and we're going to be here to do what we can do to help you. And so, members, I urge your support for this $50 million authorization of the Rural Finance Authority to continue this great program that has proved very strong and beneficial to our farmers and to our state and has worked well. I stand for questions, Mr. President. Discussion on House File 2959. Seeing no discussion, the Secretary will give House File 2959 its third reading. House, House File Number 2959, a bill for an act relating to capital investment, appropriating money for the Rural Finance Authority. Third reading. Members, final discussion on House File 2959. We're on final passage of House File 2959. Seeing no further discussion, the Secretary will take the roll.
All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 65 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and it's titled agreed to. We will continue on the agenda with the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Senator Wicklund all day, Senator Hoffman from 12.25 p.m. to the end of session. Members, any announcements of Senate interest? Senator Franzen. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a quick announcement for Monday. We will have, hopefully, still um, a day at the Capitol, the Girl Scouts, and we have a bill hearing that day. So wear green in support of Girl Scouts. I was a Girl Scout in my neighborhood, Puerto Rico, for 12 years, even though Swad Swisinski doesn't believe me. Uh, but certainly want your support. So if you have green, um, it's a good week. Uh, St. Patrick's Day is just around the corner as well. So thanks. Announcements of Senate interest. Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, I move the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, March 16th at 11 a.m. Senator Gazelka moves that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, March 16th, 2020 at 11 a.m. All those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails. The Senate is adjourned.